Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of P90X, Atari, and many more, how they overcome big challenges in life and business. This is part of the e-commerce mastery series where top sellers and experts teach you what really works to boost your e-commerce business. Our sponsor today is Acuity Scheduling. They help automate client bookings, cancellations, and reminders. I use it to book my guests and Inspired Insider. It saves me hours of back and forth emails, coordinating schedules every week with busy people like Matt. And it's one of the top three tools I use to save me tons of time. Today, I'm excited. We have Matt Getty. He's co-founder of Skinny & Company. They sell coconut oil products that have its origins in the jungles of Vietnam. They bootstrap the company to over 800,000 in revenue per year and have a special patent pending technology on how they extract the coconut oil. So they're not just like every other coconut oil out there. We'll find out what that means and how they did it. Matt, thanks for joining me. Hey, Jeremy, really, really appreciate it. Appreciate the opportunity to be on here. Um, Yeah, and hopefully we're able to provide some insight and and some information that's going to help other people, uh, just like other people on your podcast have helped us quite a bit. For sure. Thank you. And um, so first off, what's the most popular product you have? Because I notice you have some edible stuff, you have stuff, some beauty stuff. What's the most popular? Uh, yeah, so I mean, our, our products range from kind of grocery supplement all the way into the cosmetic realm. Our most popular product is the uh, 16 ounce, uh, just alkaline coconut oil. It's the product we started with. Uh, it's the product that's kind of you can use for everything. It's kind of the one stop shop. Um, and even though we've introduced other products that have been wildly successful, this is still kind of the main focal point of what people first try and initially fall in love with. So that was the first product. Mm-hmm. How did yep. you decide on, okay, because you could do many things, right? How do you decide on this should be your first one? Um, so, I mean, th- that backs up way into the story of how we got started, but it was uh, coconut oil. Um, it's kind of been a staple in our lives for a long time. We realized we could do it differently. Um, and then we've, we basically decided let's just give somebody one thing that, that has 100 different uses. And then from there, we'll go into education. Um, it was a great idea and also a terrible idea. It was giving something, somebody something that can do 100 different things. People were like, what are you selling me, snake oil? We're like, no, 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 I guarantee you can put this on your skin and eat it. Uh, but that was kind of maybe It's a paradigm shift for had. people. Absolutely, it's a paradigm shift. So it was a great idea and also a terrible idea we've, been, we've had to work through. But uh, that was kind of where we started was, hey, let's start with the broadest area. Um, we kind of started with a broad product and a broad usage into a very special niche. Yeah. So it was an interesting combination. And we'll get into some of the origins and how it started. Um, I like to jump around a little bit depending on where you take me. But um, what's interesting, so when you were eating another coconut oil, like I don't know if I would have ever thought I can make this better. What were you seeing that it wasn't fulfilling what you thought it could be? Um, so we were actually sourcing coconut oil, uh, from Vietnam. That was actually our first business we started. Well, our second business we started six years ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, Is that the Noble, as, Noble Ventures? Yeah. Okay. Noble Ventures. Uh, we're a licensed import export company out of Vietnam and we started brokering coconut oil, uh, to actually some major brands, um, mm, really? in the United States. Wow. Yeah. So, so some of the big players we were, we were helping broker and trade and mm. source from either Vietnam, the Philippines, India. And basically what we realized is that the quality that was being delivered to the American public was a tenth of probably what should have been expected. Really? And that's, it has a lot to do with international manufacturing. Uh, I think in America, we, got a, we have a great brand for quality. And if you and I are negotiating price, if I say, hey, I'm going to need this for $3, you're right. still going to give me the same quality and you're just going to take a lower margin. Right. Whereas a lot of times international manufacturers, I'm going to say, oh, yeah, I'll sell this to you for $3. <laughs> the crappy part of the coconut. But I'm... I'm still going to make my 40% margin that I need to make. And so that, that, that's, the sh- that's the shift within international manufacturing. And that's why I think a lot of products, especially food products in the States, are pretty poor quality just because we're negotiating on price, but right. we're getting terrible quality because of the price we're negotiating on. And even though they're all cert- certified and USDA organic, right. there's still bad quality coming from the right. source. And so we saw that and said, you know what? If we can do this different, if we can do it better, I bet yeah. we could actually do something special and that's kind of what we've been trying to do for yeah. the past almost three years yeah man and i find this very interesting because if you could differentiate coconut oil which on the surface people would think oh these are similar right then P- this is something to be learned there right what's someone's unique selling proposition so tell me walk me through a regular 
coconut oil that looks on the surface like this is good, but what some of those manufacturing, what makes it not as good? And then tell me about some of the manufacturing processes of yours. Because I think I read this bo- this the jar has like 14 coconuts in it or something. Or what is, what is it? Yeah, it's, it's 12 coconuts per jar. 12 coconuts that's just per jar. Because, uh, I love you, that imagery, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's just stuffing as many raw coconuts into a jar as possible is basically what we do. Um, but a, a normal coconut process. Yeah, tell me what's, um, what's wrong with that. Yeah, and then yours. So, the, so when you're manufacturing coconut at scale, your whole job is to basically dry the coconut meat to press out the oil. Um, and there's a couple of different ways to do it. There's a wet method as well. Um, but it's basically drying the meat to get the oil out. And so to dry that meat, you have to heat it at a high temperature mm. or you add uh, hydrophobic chemicals, mm. isopropyl alcohol, things like that that help dry all the moisture out. And then you press the oil out. If there's any moisture left in the meat, uh, above Waste, 5%, right? the oil is going to be rancid. Mm. So that's kind of where the whole process comes of um, a lot of dirty practices of how to get that water out. And then if there is something, a high moisture content, it's adding other chemicals to make sure that oil doesn't go rancid. Yeah. So and people then, were taking yeah. some shortcuts with that? Is that, that what it is? That's what you saw when you were importing and exporting? Yeah. So yeah, short cross, shortcuts across the board. I mean, and that happens in every, every single industry. And I right. think that's where entrepreneurs kind of get a leg up. Yeah, it's, there's something we can disrupt. There's something we can do better. The big guys are cutting corners um, just because they can and just because coconut is a commodity. Nobody knows the difference. Let's go create a difference, basically. Does the labeling reflect that oftentimes or not so much? Like, would you be able to pick up a bottle of whatever oil that you saw there were shortcuts and identify that there were shortcuts or, or not at all? Uh, not from the label, but from the look of the oil. Mm-hmm. If, you turn, if you look at a jar and you turn it over and there's going to be yellow and gray stuff at the bottom, uh, that means there's something mo- probably not right with the oil. It's been heated at a high temperature. There's chemicals. Or if the oil is super, super white and it's not kind of the cream color of coconut, that means it's, there's probably been added lye or bleach mm. just to make the really? coconut. Really? Are you serious? White. Yeah. yeah. And they, so they, I mean, they don't have to put that on the label? No, because, I mean, it, it's, still, it's still 100% coconut oil. So, I mean, there's... Jeez. And, that, and that's, there, there's no fault to the American brands here. They're just buying what they're being sold from an international manufacturer who is certified. Yeah, there's just things that go beyond the curtain. I mean, for instance, the 60-minute article on the olive oil, where 70% oh, of the yeah, oil Oh, yeah, that's crazy. Yes. It's fake, but that was the same system where it's all, all the olive oil manufacturers in Italy are certified. Their labels say everything that's correct. But as the consumer, we don't know because they're cutting corners internationally and being dishonest, similar to coconut oil. And that's where we have a leg up is, I mean, we are one of the only few fa- – one of the few brands in the United States that sources right. their oil from their own factory. Right. So we're controlling all the way from you. coconut to table. So that's kind of where our differentiation is, because we're controlling it all the way through, and it's been a pain in the butt <laughs> to make it happen, but we've been slowly working it on, and I think that's where success has come from, because people can tell that there's a quality there. Yeah. Um, and then with our, what, our skinny family that we've created in our community – I mean, we're committed to giving them the best for themselves, yeah. for their families, for their friends, et cetera. So talk about then, so that's the typical manufacturing route. And talk about yours. Yeah, so, we, uh, so we, actually, we actually pick our coconuts from the wild jungles of Vietnam. Right. And so um, we have about 60, uh, 60 people in the jungles that we employ. We have really? three different factories. They'll go out, they'll pick the coconuts, uh, they'll bring them in. Everything we do uh, is basically hand labor. So we're peeling the coconuts, we're grinding wow. the coconut meat, uh, and then we're putting it into our Neutralize technology, which is our patent pending process. Mm. And that basically dries the meat in a cold, uh, basically airtight facility. So the moisture actually drops, but we're actually not losing any of the integrity of the meat. And we're getting that moisture level before 5%, where then we then hand press the oil out. Yeah. Um, this is a so serious, that, like, labor intensive process. <laughs> Super labor intensive. And I mean, that's why, I mean, I think we are the most expensive coconut on the market. So what does it cost? What does it cost to buy uh, 12 coconuts in a jar? To buy 12 coconuts in a jar, our retail is, uh, I think, $36 for a 16-ounce jar. Okay. Yeah. So it's, it's, uh, okay. Compared to Trader Joe's, where you can buy a 12-ounce jar for $7. So yeah. Yeah. So it's $36 for, and, and what is the difference of the texture? Is it like... A liquid because I know a lot of them are just a solid form and you have to actually scoop it out what's the the texture difference 
Um, so, I mean, we, we see, smell, and taste different. So if someone has tried coconut and they try skinny, we have a very high retention rate because they normally don't go back because we yeah. are that significantly different. Mm. Uh, the coconut oil state change actually happens with most coconuts at 76 degrees. It's a very volatile oil. Yes. So at, if it's hotter than 76, it'll liquefy. If it's warmer than – or if it's cooler than 76, it'll solidify. Right. Uh, so it's just – it's also a good way to test the temperature in your house. You're like, oh, my house is super hot right now. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, but yeah, I mean that's kind of uh, – that's our difference, and that's kind of where, if we, if I can get a jar of skinny into your hands and you can try it or a sample, we typically people will typically stick around just yeah. because they know that it's quality. Yeah. How do you get over that barrier? Because that's a big differential on price. Yeah, it's a big differentiation on price, and that is where um, it's it's marketing, it's earned marketing, it's conferences, it's education, it's fighting an uphill battle. Um, but it's once again getting that sample in their hand and saying, hey, you know what? We have something different. Uh, we don't recommend cooking with our coconut oil because it is expensive. I mean, right. there's some coconuts out there that are pure that we recommend them to. Uh, we actually are launching a, a cooking coconut oil that is pure from our factory that we just built. Um, but it's, hey, this is our oil. Eat it in its raw state. I mean, the 16-ounce jar will last you two months. So it's what are you supposed to do with that? Are you supposed to like have a teaspoon a day? What do you, rec- what do, you do? Um. Oh, I, I eat like half a jar a day. I, I eat. Some, I feel like I go through a thousand dollars worth of product per week. That's that. Is, I, yeah, I have a very expensive habit. <laughs> right, I could see myself um, doing that too. Yeah, but it's it's eating. We recommend three spoonfuls a day. Uh, it's great for your metabolism. It's good for mental clarity. It helps with over, we've seen it help with overall immune boost function. Uh, it's good for oil pulling, which is the act of swishing oil in your mouth like a mouthwash. Uh, and then it's great for your skin. It's nourishing. It's hydrating. Uh, it is a healthy saturated fat. And so with us being alkaline and the only alkaline coconut on the market, uh, we actually absorb into your body at a much higher ratio. Mm-hmm. So when you buy skin, you're actually getting much more, you're getting a much better bang for your buck and a much higher value because your body's yeah. going to be able to absorb those nutrients. Yeah. I'm up for testing it. I'll buy a bottle. Um, so I'll well, probably send you a bottle. Yeah. You, look, you look like you'd like it. Uh, yeah. Um, so tell me about the biggest skeptic that actually that you turned around. And how do you turn them around? These are like, you know, this is really expensive. Because I'm saying that because I'm sure a lot of people have products or, or um, you know, services that may be priced higher because they're better, they're higher quality. But you still have to overcome that. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Um, well, I mean, first, there's the two people. It's the people that think coconut is bad for you because coconut oil, technically, up to 2013, when the FDA came out and said, actually. Saturated fats are good for you. Coconut, we've been told, has been bad for us since the 40s. Right. So you've got, you've got the older generation who thinks coconut is going to give them a heart attack. So that's an exciting barrier to overcome, convincing, hey, this actually isn't going to kill you. I guarantee it's going to make you feel better. And then you've got the somebody who's, hey, I buy Trader Joe's. It works well for me. Right. I, I would be crazy to go buy your jar. Right. And that's right. where it's, hey, you know what? That sounds fantastic. Coconut is good for you overall. But it's, we're doing something different here. And if you want to be a part of something, we're giving back. We're doing an initiative. There's social aspects behind our jar, not apart from also just making a higher quality product. Mm-hmm. You're more than welcome to. And you're not 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 everyone's for us. I mean, we, yeah. we definitely have a niche. We definitely have a target market. Yeah. Uh, but the people who typically do try our product, they become uh, loyal followers. Yeah. I mean, I think I actually didn't realize on our website we've got quite a few. I think we have 500 reviews, and of those 500 reviews, I think 94% are five star. Just from people who bought our product, and I, our, our director of IT was like, "Did you know this?" And I was like, "Oh, I, I had no idea," which I, it's something that we'll get into later about following reviews and utilizing them. <laughs> right. Uh, but it's 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 a testament to I think people recognize quality, and I think as the consumer base, we're all heading towards wanting higher quality products. We're sick yeah. of being tired. We're sick of being unhealthy. Yeah. For we sure. want companies who are socially responsible to give us something that makes us feel better. Yeah. Um. And we'll talk about some of the, the tough things. I mean, you have your own, you know, factories. You know, this mm-hmm. is not like, okay, we're just going to source something and send it over and slap our label on it. You are actually on the grounds and people are picking these coconuts. How many coconuts can, can one person pick in a day? Um, so one person can pick and peel about 500 coconuts in a day. R- that many? It's Holy it's, cow. You, you will, I mean, it's, we've, we've got some incredible, um, Vietnamese that work with us and it's unbelievable. I mean, I, I could probably do 10 in a day. I mean, if they're up there. <laughs> That's I mean, nuts. 
it's it's unbelievable the amount of coconuts right wow. there to process in a day and um so what yeah. do you do with the meat like you you press the oil out of it what do you do with the rest of it um so the meat can be used for coconut flour i mean we there's some product extensions there we could bring to the market ourselves right now we're actually selling it to a partner factory who actually turns it into animal feed and really? then exports it uh yeah and so the whole coconut is able to be used. So your yeah. the coconut husk is uh, can be used for activated uh, charcoal, wow, uh, and carbon for filtration. Uh, the coconut shell can be used for like burning charcoal, almost like briskets. And then you've got the coconut water, which is coconut water, which we also sell to another factory that is a Tetra Pak facility, and they bottle it and ship it out. So we're actually so you didn't you didn't ever want to do the coconut water thing. Is that too competitive? Whoa. Well, I mean, there's no, for us, we're working on some different areas, but there's no differentiation for us right now. Right. The only thing would be just a product ex- line extension, uh, which right. I mean, which may be good. It'd be quality. We would know that it's coming from. We know that it's sourced directly, but there's a couple of coconut waters out there that are actually doing a pretty good job. Yeah. And so until we're able to come up with a new way to either do a, a, a different kind of pasteurization yeah. that you're able to keep some of the integrity or nutrients. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, and it's extremely competitive. I mean, yeah. any single time you've got Coke and Pepsi competing in a market, it's kind of like, yeah, maybe uh, <laughs> in a market that's not differentiated. And I mean, until we yeah. find that unique selling point, we probably won't jump into the game. Yeah, no, I'm glad you're mentioning that. And you're, I, that's why I want to hear your thought process behind it, because obviously you have a product if you wanted to, to do it. Mm-hmm. But you are looking for how can you be different and stand apart, even if yeah. you have it right in your hands, you could probably not easily, but start bottling coconut water and it'd be high quality. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it would. Yeah, it'd be high quality. It'd be direct from the source, um, but it's 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 kind of like yeah. Where where do we want to put the resources? What do we want to do? We're still a small business. Um, where do we want to compete? Yeah. And I mean, it, the market is it's very saturated. And until we figure out something to do differently, I, it, it it sounds like instead of working twenty hours a day, we'd be working like twenty two hours a day. <laughs> so how much do those companies love you for doing all the work and then saying, "Here's the coconut water." Uh, I mean, they like they like it a lot. Was that hard to find a partnership with that, or how in, did that come about? In Vietnam, it was. I mean, initially we were the coconut water. There was not a coconut water facility that was around because they're in Brazil very, mostly. Brazil, Philippines, India. Um, yeah. There's a couple new factories that have popped up around us, and that those who we partnered before that, we would just give the coconut water to our workers, and we'd use it. We still let them take whatever they want. Um, but now, yeah, we're able to give it give it to the partner. Yeah, and they they love it just because they're not having to do any of the processing. We're just giving them the water. They're happy. Yeah, we make a couple pennies, and it's all good to go. Yeah, that's really cool. So early on, tell me what worked for sales, and then tell me what what works now. Um, I mean, early on when it was just basically my brother and I uh, and our marketing guys sitting around and our basically boxers talking about how we're going to do this. It was uh, blog outreach. Getting out there, we had samples of our product and basically emailing and calling as many people as we could possibly find who would be interested in our product. I mean, yeah. ranging from a medicinal blog to a bicycle blog of, hey, we'd love for you to review our product. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think the, the blogger atmosphere has changed a lot in three years. It's become much more commercialized. Uh, but three years ago, I mean, most people would say, hey, yeah, we'd love to try your sample. We'd love to try your product. And that was kind of where our whole day was basically spent hey, how many bloggers can we reach out to? How many samples can we send out? Yeah. This is our budget. And then that was kind of where the online sales started generating because we didn't have money. We found it was more effective for us to send out a jar than to try to go spend $3 really? uh, for Google Ads. Would you send out a full jar or would you have something special created to send out these samples? Initially, we would send out a full jar, which was probably our mistake just because uh, we only had one size jar. We had one size label. We're like, well, I guess it just makes sense just to do this instead of doing something else. I mean, now we have all the way from half ounce, two ounce, four ounce, eight ounce, sixteen ounce, just for depending on the blog and the size and mm-hmm. the followership and more structure. But initially, I mean, anyone who wanted a sixteen ounce jar got a sixteen ounce jar, whether they had five readers or a million readers. Yeah, they got the same thing. Um, and I think that was, and that's the naivety of it all. I mean, obviously, when you're starting a business, you're naive to the fact that there's certain ways to do things yeah. and certain ways to do not. And I think yeah. that's where. I think a lot of entrepreneurs find their success is because, well, we just didn't know better. Yeah. So we were basically just walking around blind, giving the people 16-ounce jars, and that's where the online sales started generating uh, and coming forth. Yeah. Was it naive only, or was it also 
well, then we're going to have to create this whole new size jar and label and all this other stuff. It, it was also, it was definitely that as well. Just, hey, we don't, one, well, we didn't have the money to go print another couple thousand labels of a different size yeah. and trying to source a new jar and then figuring out how do we pack that so it's just not in my mother's kitchen. I mean, those are all sorts of things that uh, that came across our mind and created, came across our head. So yeah, it was just just the initial, this is this is the path of least resistance. Uh, and I think when we were first started anyways, we actually didn't even know what our full cost of jar was. And so <laughs> we look back now, we're like, oh, that was, that was a pretty expensive marketing push. But I mean, luckily we were able to make it through it. So, so what was one of the bloggers um, or sites that you reached out to that really surprised you, that gave you a lot of traction? Um, there was, so the Detoxinista, who's actually, she's got a massive blog now. Uh, but when we first talked, I think two, two and a half years ago, she was a little, a little smaller, but mm-hmm. she had a really high quality followership, um, where, I mean, sh- she wrote about us, we communicated and I mean, as f- just as far as traffic and sales conversion yeah. was extremely high. And it was just because the people who followed her really respected what she did. Yeah. Um, and it was great. And then another one was, I think we did a podcast with uh, a Canadian blogger, Joyous Health. And that was another one where the people, her followership was very loyal. Hmm. And that's where if you can find a blog whose people really, really like the girl and like, or like the man or just right. like their mission. They and trust what they're doing. the person. Absolutely. It's all about, yeah. I mean, that's what, that's where it's, it's all about trust. So th- those were two that were actually surprising. Like, oh, wow, that was that was really, really well. That went great. <laughs> How did you find the Toxinista? That seems like a random, right? Random blog. <laughs> uh, to be honest, it was Google. I mean, Googling uh, top twenty-five or top. It was basically top health blogs yeah. in America, and then basically clicking all the way to Google page one hundred, just writing down different people to reach out to. So it was just kind of. I mean, it was almost like approaching like a cold call sale of hey let's let's this is our territory let's find how many names and numbers are in this territory and then let's just get cranking away yeah so what uh what else worked really well for you blogs outreach with podcasts um so i mean i would our success has come from content from videos and then education yeah um whenever we were able to get our content train going get that flywheel as everyone talks about turning. Uh, I mean, things would just start happening. We would get more outreach. We'd get more people to the website. We'd yeah. get more followership. More people would read our blogs. We'd get more videos. Yeah. And then we'd get busy and we'd stop. And all of a sudden, online sales would start diving. And you're like, well, what's happening? Oh, well, I guess we, we haven't written a blog in three weeks. Well, let's start re- writing a blog. And so that was kind of the whole just running. And I think that's a even though you're a small business, you still got to run your business as a business where it's more right. systemized and right. managed. And that was one thing that we always lacked. That we'd get it going, and I think we would just expect that it would keep going and it would stop. Yeah, and we'd get it going again. And so for the past, I mean, I think for the first six months, that was our problem. We'd get it going and it die. We'd get it going and it die. Where now, I mean, now that we're more developed, the system's running and yeah. our success is growing exponentially. But yeah, yeah initially that's well because you have to do everything. Right. Yeah. I mean, now you actually have employees, so yeah. you can't. You don't have to do everything. Um, what's the content creation schedule look like now? Um, so we release two videos a week. Uh, we're posting on um, five social media channels uh, at least once or twice a day. Uh, we have two blogs written a week that are yeah. posted on our website, and then we try to basically get a blogger review at least five days out of the week. So we're, we're just trying to grow that digital footprint as large as possible and get as much interaction inside and outside. And then we also send a weekly email to our newsletters or to our skinny family newsletter fellowship of, hey, this is a new product. Here's a great coupon code. Or, hey, here's a great video. Here's another blog. Here's mm-hmm. some great information on coconut oil, et cetera. Yeah. So, Matt, tell me about how do you plan what you're going to do in the video? Someone's thinking, well, how many videos could you actually do on, on coconut oil? Or, or they're <laughs> thinking for their own product. Let's say it's like a pen company. Like how many videos can I do per week on a pen? What, how do you plan the content for the videos? I mean, for us, I mean, it, I think coconut is easy because you have all those uses. I mean, we could do a DIY coconut video for the next probably 100 years, to be honest, just because yeah. there's so many different things you can do with coconut oil. So for that, I think we, we're, we're lucky uh, and we're fortunate. Uh, but for us, it's different. And there's also a lot of education behind why we're different. So yeah. there's a lot of videos of, hey, this is product differentiation video. There's this question. 
Um, and then a lot of questions we get on our website, we'll actually put on a video series that we're actually launching soon. It's called yeah. basically Q and A with Kay. Kaylin's actually our marketer, our chief marketing officer. She's the face of our videos as well. Yeah. And it's kind of her answering a customer's question of, "Hey, how do you use the shampoo bar?" Or coconut oil is said to do this. Is this true? And so trying to interact with our our customers and see what are they asking and putting on a video for most people because it's kind of like most things. If someone's got the question. I bet somebody else has the that's, same question. This is a great method. So Q and A K will be one day a week, and then what will yeah. be the other video? I think the other video is going to be a product feature, product usage, mm-hmm. um, and then on top of those, every single month we're going to do kind of a, a Today Show esque mm-hmm. cooking video where it's kind of uh, we actually had one of our our inside sales managers actually was a chef in her former life. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, so she's able to put some nice recipes together. Um, and we also just like to do some some funny videos as well because we don't like to take ourselves too seriously. So we've right. got some ideas of um, like coconut kisses or how skinny coconut saves a day, all sorts of things that we're, we're working on and developing of, I mean, what are people going to react to? What are people going to like? Um, and I think as constant goes, if, if you are a pen company, it's just getting ideas from your customers. Right. Like, yeah. I mean, I how, love how that. You Let it come to? from them. Because yeah. you yeah. do that with not just content, but with products too. Right. Mm-hmm. So, what have you gleaned from because you listen to your your customers? Because you see, so you started with the coconut oil. What was next? So we started with the coconut oil, and then in January uh, 2015. So this is a year and a half after we launched our beauty line. So people would always ask us, "Well, why would I eat a jar? Like, why would I put something on my skin that I can eat?" Right. Right. And we're like, well, you just do it. Like, but then when you're so close to something, it just makes sense to you. But I mean, normally you're not like gonna... you just slap beauty on the same exact jar. <laughs> like, here, put it on your body. This one you could eat. This one you put on your body. Is that what you're? So that was kind of initially where we went. Yeah, and right. then we launched kind of our initial original line, which was uh, a facial oil, which is moisturizing for your face, a body butter, and then a lip balm. Yeah. And then basically, and one day a customer sat and was like, hey, you know what? I would love something that would exfoliate my skin. And I'm like, well, I, don't, I mean, co- coconut is not exfoliating. So we went back and I started talking to her. And then that's where we launched our coconut sugar scrub. And that's actually probably been our most successful beauty product. Really? And again, and that was something that came from a customer. And so we've got some other products in the pipeline too of customers saying, hey, I would love this. Hey, my hus- I would love to get something that I could give to my husband that doesn't look and smell so feminine. And we're like, oh. All right, well, let's start working on that. And so, uh, and that's where it's, I mean, their customer is obviously our greatest asset right. and um, our followership. And so if they tell us something, more than likely we're going to try it. And whether it's successful or not, we'll find out. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, that's kind of where it's, where it's at. Now, what's your method for listening to customers? Because obviously you probably get a lot of requests that you can't fulfill on. And how do you decide what you fulfill on and not and your method for actually turning that into a product um a lot of it is multiple requests so a lot of times i mean we we make an mission to respond to our people our customer within 24 hours and a lot of times hey thank you so much we're going to take that into consideration but then one of our customer service girls is going to come back and say hey guys i've had 275 people ask about yeah. ex- some sort of exfoliation thing so will and she log it on a separate like where does it go like once someone says it just so people know, okay, like how does he even keep track of all these possible ideas or products? So we use uh, the app through Shopify. Well, I guess it's everywhere now, Zendesk. And so Zendesk has a lot of different compartments and okay. folders where you can log customer requests and complaints and all sorts of things. Okay. And so, yeah, we, we've got the file of, hey, like basically it's product ideas. Got and it. We've got, we've got someone in the office who her basically job outside 9 to 5 is, products R&D, and so the girls work together with and handing them, hey, these are some ideas that customers are looking for. Let's actually see if it's a viable option. So, so tell them, yeah, go ahead. I was just thinking a lot of it's just, a lot of it's just manual too. I mean, I'm sure yeah. there's an automated system out there that would log it all and tag it all, but yeah. I mean, right now it's just mostly manual. Was there a product that took you a long time to launch um, that you pushed back on initially because you didn't think it would do well? But then, you know, then obviously, eventually, you're laughing. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Our uh, so our shampoo bar. Yeah. Who who wants? Uh, my initial thought was when it was approached to me, and this is actually the the one. This is the first product that we've ever had that I did not personally develop myself. 
this was actually one of our internal people came up with this, designed it, developed it, and really? presented it to me. And my first reaction was, well, who wants to, who would want to just use a bar to shampoo their hair with? It's like, that sounds idiotic. <laughs> <laughs> I saw that. That does stick out on the site as, you know, which one doesn't look like the rest? I mean, it's not exactly. in a jar. It's just a, a bar, almost like looks like a bar of soap, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. And it, it is it is a hundred percent coconut oil with essential oils, uh, and there's a unique way we do it within cooling and heating, and it basically is a saponified coconut oil that really works. And so I started using it, and I was like, oh my, my hair feels fantastic. Uh, it cleans it, it gets all the sap, the, the flaphates, sulfates, and parabens out of your scalp and out of your hair, and so it's very nourishing for your scalp. Yeah. Um, and so I started using it, and I said, all right, let's. Let's put 12 on the website and see what happens. How hard is it to produce? Because, again, just putting 12 on the website means you still have to go through the R&D. You have to create it. How long did it actually take you to create it once there was an idea? Um, I mean, I think our R&D cycle is anywhere from six weeks to six months. So right. I think the shampoo bar fell probably within the whole three-month mark. And we still actually haven't perfected our packaging. We're still developing the packaging of how to make it work for better for the consumer and look a little probably classier so it doesn't look so raw. I mean, no pun intended. But yeah, but it's, it's sort of like said, it's sort of the look of your product. So I mean, your look, your product yeah. is raw. You know, I don't know. But I, as we as we we're we're selling it in quite a few so, like salons and spas now, and that's kind of the request is, hey, is there is there another way we can box this so it doesn't just look like there's a random bar on the on the countertop and we're like yeah i guess we could look that makes sense um but yeah i mean the the shampoo bar was that instance of hesitant didn't really want to launch it didn't know what people think about it why would a woman i mean women are i mean i mean very I've particular got sisters, i've got a mother yeah, they're very yeah. particular about what they're putting on their hair and i mean we put it on the website within the first a guy could care less it's like you're like yeah i'll just exactly. put a coconut <laughs> thing on my hair it's no big deal so, so you we put uh, it on the site yeah so we uh we sold the 12 bars, I think, within the first two hours to all women. Um, yeah. And I was like, all right, well, mark them down. And then we're, we're going to call You're those call customers them. Yeah. in the yeah. next two weeks to see what they thought. And they all loved it. We had one customer who was like, well, my hair my hair, my hair, hair is a little dry. But then I just used my normal conditioner. And it was fantastic. And that's kind of where it was like, huh, that actually, that actually might work. Why did they buy it in the first place? Like you were so skeptical that they would even buy something like this. What did they say when you talked to them? They they just thought it sounded unique. It was it was natural. It was clean. It was natural. I mean, it's just the original bar was just coconut oil. Yeah. So they were looking for a solution that was not full of chemicals. That was going to be, and they were willing to take the risk, and they took the risk, and they loved it. And then they started telling their friends, and then from there, uh, it's kind of snowballed. So I mean, we're now selling. We went from selling twelve to I think now we're selling. We have three different varieties, and we're selling basically hundreds every week, which isn't a ton, but it's still. For something that was an organic, kind of out of the nowhere shot, it's oh that that actually works pretty well. And now I think uh, I think Sephora is actually gonna well maybe there we've got some other big customers looking for it, looking at it as well. That's awesome. So, can you produce this yourself in your factory, or do you have to just get the raw materials and have someone who makes these type of products do it? Um, so everything we do is ourselves. Really? So yep, every we've got a. Uh, We've got a 5,000 square foot kind of production facility uh, slash warehouse. Um, we do some fulfilling out of there as well, and we've got a we've got a certified clean room. It's FDA checked, everything like that, and that is where uh, the product happens. So yeah, to make the shampoo bar, I mean, we had to get um, these larger vats, these ice chests, and things like that. Right. And everything we do is, I mean, we're bootstrapping every little thing, and right. so it's not like we're buying a giant ice chest. We're buying these tiny ice chests, and remember, we're making. 42 at a time yeah uh but yeah every and that's that's kind of our commitment too is no matter what we're doing we want to do it in-house as long as possible just to make sure that we're controlling the quality and if we do go out and outsource to a co-packer then that co-packer needs to follow these strict criteria yeah Yeah. so i'm surprised you agreed to that you're like i don't want to buy these small ice chests and produce these bars how'd they convince you (laughs) I've, there's a, there's a lot of persuasive women in the office. I'm gonna okay. be honest. <laughs> I mean, did they produce a, a, like a prototype or something, or did they just they did? Yeah, I I came back from uh I think I was on a week or I was on, gone for a week and I came back and there was yeah just a, a shampoo bar on my desk. And they was, just hey, produced it. it. They made it. Yeah, I was like, hey, I think one. Of, I think the first one was made in someone's kitchen, and it was they just had the idea. I'm like, hey, 
give this a try and see what happens. Wow. Okay. Um, and yeah, and that, I mean, the whole idea actually came from our IT director's wife who, I mean, she's a DIYer. She had a good idea. She thought she worked it out and, she, and actually, and it worked really well. And so, but yeah, that was kind of, it was a unique, a unique process, which is nice. I mean, it's like, oh, this is, this is fantastic. <laughs> so what's one that you turned down, you actually turned down and didn't go with? Um, so we turned down a couple different things. Um, a uh, a chocolate whipped body butter. We we is made, that we edible created, or, or not? It was just for it. Was, it was edible. It sounds <laughs> edible. It sounds good. It was it was delicious. It just it was it was a pain to manufacture. It was sticky. It didn't work that well. Was it chocolate or what? Yeah, the chocolate, and it was it was hard to get the the shelf life up. I think it's a great idea, and if we could figure out a different formula to make it happen, maybe that's something we launch for an exclusive Valentine's Day special or something like that along the road. But yeah, it was it was just something that we just couldn't quite get it to work. And I was like, this is going to take a lot more time where there's these other products we can develop a whole lot quicker and put yeah. and push into the line. And nobody was asking for it. It was kind of one of those, oh, this sounds like it would be absolutely great. Let's make it happen. And then it just failed miserably. Yeah. So it goes back to listening to your, your customers and what they want. Customers yeah. always right. Yeah. <laughs> so talk about the biggest sales day you ever had so the so until actually the biggest sales day came actually in january uh we well it was over a weekend um and this is this is apart from e-commerce but we wrote i think two hundred thousand dollars of business in like three days wow which was huge for us because i mean last year's sales were 800 but this year we're already on track for for i think three million which is pretty wow. cool congratulations wow. um, three thanks. days two hundred thousand dollars so it was, it was crazy yeah um, it, we were at a we were at a at a at a trade show within a uh, a different kind of market, and the people who were there, and the buyers who were there, and the wholesalers and retailers were there really liked the product. We liked that everything we do is edible, everything we do is less than five ingredients, and we're as natural and raw as possible. Right. And so that really just that really aligned with kind of what their mission and goals were. And so we were yeah we were a hot selling product and brand, and we've got a, a lot of great customers and um, basically followers from it, and it's a lot of people who will continue to help us grow um, over the past. And as far as e-commerce goes. So that's uh, like store, like retail stores wanting to hold it. Yep. And then e-commerce, our biggest day was actually, it was March 2014. We were so just like a getting year going. Ago. Um, yeah. And we were actually featured on a Yahoo Shine article about oil pulling. And we weren't even, the coconut wasn't even mentioned. It was a picture yeah. of our jar on this video yeah and i think we get, i think we thought the website broke we're like oh well this someone's playing a joke on us so i think we got like 1100 orders in like three hours wow so i think it was i think it ended up being almost seventy thousand dollars worth of sales um online in a day and when you're a startup you're like oh oh we've made it <laughs> well we didn't make it at all it was actually <laughs> miserable so we didn't have any stockers we, we thought the oh. website was broken so we just kept putting our product back in stock thinking well, for someone who actually wants to buy the product, we don't want to show that's out of stock. So we, um, I think. Why we did were, you I mean, think you thought it was a joke? I mean, what did you think was a glitch? What did you? What were you thinking? So I mean, we, this was six months into the business, yeah. and up until that time, I mean, I think the the biggest day we've ever had was like a thousand dollars of online sales. Right. And you're going from a thousand to sixty thousand, and you didn't know there's an article or a, out there. You're, right. you're just like, oh, well, Shopify must, must be a glitch. Something must be happening. I mean, there's there's no way this is a reality. I was out of town actually. I was out in California. My brother was texting it's me even like, better. Like, dude, do we do we need to close the website? Like, what's going on? This is a joke. And all of a sudden, I looked and I was like, no, guys, that's real. And then so we put the product out of stock immediately because we had already sold. I think it was 1,100 orders, like 1,400 units, and I think we had 70 units in stock. Seven. Seventy. Oh, seventy. Wow. But so then, what from, do you do? <laughs> I mean, we manufactured in Vietnam. So we, we called our partner in Vietnam and said, you've just got to go produce as much coconut as you humanly possibly can. And every single time you've got a five-gallon bucket, we've got to basically airship it over. So, I mean, it, it almost put us under just because... You wanted I mean, to we fulfill. Pissed, I mean, we pissed off 1,100 people because we couldn't fulfill their orders for probably five or six weeks. And by that time, there was three of us. And so... I would just, I mean, obviously, you're trying to act like a legit business, and I'm like, guys, it's sometimes you're on a customer at three a.m. in the morning. I'm like, I'm actually in my my boxes right now, trying to pack this order for you, and we're gonna get it to you as quickly as possible. But it was kind of one of those, 
uh, where the success almost just became our 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 de- um, your demise, our downfall. Yeah, 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 our demise. So, in that situation, are you just honest with people? You're like, I'm in my boxers, I'm packing. Them. I mean, what do you say to the customers? Like, I mean, typically, I'm not, I'm 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 not telling them in my boxers, but more like guys. <laughs> hey, hey, I don't want that visual, Matt. But <laughs> I apologize. I apologize for whoever's listening. It's I'm actually fully clothed right now, so we're good to go. Um, it's hey, we're a we're a small family business. We're going to do this the best we can. Yeah. Uh, a lot. I mean, we basically just started giving people like 50% off your order or, Hey, we're going to take off free shipping or, Hey, we're going to yeah. do this or give you 70% off your order. And those are just trying to rectify yeah. any situation as possible. And most of the part, I mean, what we realize is 90% of people are typically okay. It's the 10% they're going to call you every day for five weeks. And that's just, that's, I mean, I think you talk to anyone within yeah. business, it's the 90, 80, 10 rule. 20, 90, 10. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So most of the people are fine. Like, Hey, we understand Get it to us when you can, not a problem. But then you have those people that you've refunded 14 times and they're still calling you. And you're like, all right, well, <laughs> we're so sorry. Block so the IP address. No. Yeah. Absolutely. But I mean, I, and, and they had told they had an absolute right to be upset just because, I mean, it was totally our fault. I mean, and that's a big learning lesson too is ever since then, I mean, if a product's out of stock, it's out of stock. I mean, it's done. Let's And we always try to get orders out basically within 24 hours now too just to make sure that we want to make sure the customer is as happy as possible because they're investing in us and we want to make sure that we're delivering so that they feel like there's a value add not only on the customer service side but also on the product value side. Can they order it if it's out of stock? Like, um, On our website, no. I mean, no. they can put in their email or they're going to get a notification when it's back in stock. Uh, but, I mean, now... You don't want think- them paying for it without having it in stock. So you'll yeah. just say, here... Get notified when it comes back in stock, and then they'll get a notification. That's a painful thing to do. You have like yeah. a ready credit card in hand buying customer, and you're telling them you can't buy. And that is it is a constant struggle between my CFO and I. I'm just like, dude, let's just let's take the order. We're gonna get it out to them. They're gonna be just fine. And he's no. We're just like, we're not until the, we're not we're not charging anything until that order is shipped, and that's the right thing to do. Is there a software that does that, or for people there, like? There is an app. So we use the Shopify as our back-end website system. Yeah. And um, there are a couple different apps of like out-of-stock apps where if your order's out of stock, they'll take the email, and as soon as you put inventory back into your system, it, it emails all those customers letting them know that that product's back in stock. Mm-hmm. And you can send them like a 10% discount. Or something is that like a that. Shopify app, or what do you use for that? Yeah, there's a Shopify app. Okay. I think it's, uh, I mean, as we can keep talking Something with out-of-stock. Someone can yeah. out of stock. <laughs> I'm sure, that's the exact name. Actually. I like the terminology that you said. Actually, I would think that give you a lot of leeway when you say we're a small family business. You know, because it, it is your your mom works in the company, right? And your brother. Yeah. Um, that's a good way of putting it. Um, I'm not saying someone should do it if they're not a small family business, but you actually are, and I can see that being like, oh yeah, like we want to stick with you. Do you, do you um, use that a lot, or do you, was that does it, that naturally come out when you um, are backlogged with orders and you're just trying to, to fend people off? I mean, we don't. We typically try to use we're a small family business as like a positive, not as an excuse. Right, right. But yeah, I mean, there's. I think it just depends on the person. I mean, sometimes the novelty of hey, we're trying to we're trying this, we're doing something different. People will respect that, and then sometimes they're like, hey, listen. You may be a small family business, but you're still a business, and so I have my expectations that you're going right. to be my needs as a Walmart would be my needs. And so yeah. those are just the different expectations within different customers, yeah. and it's just making sure that everyone feels valued no matter what side of the tracks they're on when they yeah. walk away from the situation. So, Matt, with the article, that was huge for you. How how that even come about that you were featured in that Yahoo article? Oh, we have no idea. We actually still have no idea. We actually we, we reached out to the person who wrote the article. We didn't have, We never heard back from her. Uh, but it was I, my guess is she oh. was she was writing an article on oil pulling. What is and, oil pulling, by the way? Uh, oh yeah, great question. Let me, let say, me digress for people who quick. don't know, and myself who <laughs> does not know. Uh, oil I pulling. Did, is the I act. did see that some products on your on your site. It's like oil. It's called oil pulling, and I'm like, oh, I have mm-hmm. to ask what what that is. So, uh, so oil pulling is an old Ayurvedic method. Ayurvedic medicine is the first medicine ever written down 2,000 years ago in India. Yeah. Uh, and it was a method used to detoxify your body. Uh, so oil pulling is the act of switching oil in your mouth like a mouthwash hmm. for 5 to 20 minutes. Sounds like a long time. Uh, but what it does is it, it helps what they call oil pulling is it pulls the toxins out of your body. Really? Hmm. Coincidentally, coconut oil, actually the lauric acid, which is um, a fatty acid in coconut oil, 
actually has a chemical reaction with an enzyme in someone in your person in a person's saliva hmm. that actually creates an emulsion factor and so helps p- whiten people's teeth, freshen really? their breath, and shrinken their gums. So yeah, coconut oil within the oil pulling realm actually helps increase your overall oral health, hmm. and that's kind of where we're a big proponent is due to the fact we're an alkaline coconut oil, uh, we're safe for your teeth. So what do people do with that? It's a peppermint oil pulling, right? Yep. So, so you do just they take use it strictly for mouth like hygiene? Yeah. So it's, I mean, we recommend it as a daily thing. It's part of your daily routine. You're going to wake up in the morning, you're going to jump in the shower, put a spoonful of uh, peppermint oil pulling coconut oil in your mouth, swish it around when you get out, you spit it in the trash can, spit it in your toilet, and then get you on with your it? day. Can you eat it? I don't know. Can you swallow uh, it? Or it's no, got so toxins after, in it. Yeah. So you, gotcha. you basically, we recommend it after five minutes, you're going to want to spit it out. You're not going to want to swallow it. And you're just going to swish it around like a mouthwash, just going about your normal day. And we put the peppermint in there to make it feel like it's more refreshing. Um, we use a therapeutic grade peppermint as well. So it's actually peppermint's good for just kind of energy and uh, overall digestive health yeah. as well. So is there a toothpaste on the market for this? Like you don't use this as a toothpaste. It's strictly as a mouthwash, right? Um, I was having this conversation the other day, actually. And I was wondering, is there a natural toothpaste that works? Because I have two family members who are dentists. And mm-hmm. I was looking at the ingredients on my toothpaste. I'm like, this is absolutely horrible. So is do you have a toothpaste or is there a, a toothpaste out there? We do not have a toothpaste. I actually mm-hmm. just use our normal coconut oil as my toothpaste Yeah. just because I think it works. I mean, we've been... The normal coconut thing. oil. Just the one the you eat. The normal coconut oil. Yeah, yeah. I just I dip my toothbrush in it and I just swish around and I mean, it's worked so far. Um, that's another thing customers have asked for is, hey, why don't you guys develop mm-hmm. a toothpaste? Those are things that it's in the R and D section. Maybe we'll develop, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's hard to create. I mean, I think it's it's not the thing where toothpaste is toothpaste, and people people have their crest. They use this, they use that, right? But then giving them a natural solution. I know there are natural toothpastes out there uh, that some people like, some people don't. Yeah. So I don't really have. Okay, a, I'm glad you explained uh, the oil pulling things. I was not sure about that, <laughs> and um, so on the retail front, go back to the retail front. You know, you in that three days. Retail is a lot different from e-commerce. So mm-hmm. what have you found are some of the challenges with, with retail? I mean, retail, you're not interacting with the end customer at all. You're using a third-party provider, and so you, it's more of a concern of how are we going to market through this person to make sure the customer is understanding our product when they're looking at it on a shelf. When we're stacked up against 13 other coconut oils, how is someone going to know we're different? I mean, right. I think we've got a good-looking brand, and so that will attract people to it. But then once they pick right. us up, why are they going to choose us when we're thirty-six dollars? When right. you could go the one next to them is twelve dollars, right? And that is so the biggest challenge. Is yeah. yeah, is getting that information and crossing through that information. Um, and that is just we've got some unique uh, POP displays, some unique marketing materials, hang tags from the jars. I mean, trying to make just as much noise as possible around that jar. So when someone picks it up. They can get the, hey, this is why skinny is different, one, two, three. We recommend you pick us up. You're going to be happy if you did. What's good advice you've gotten? Because I'm sure they want to sell through. Did, they, did you get any great advice from some of these retailers of what you should be doing once you get in the store? Um, they all love product samplings, which is another problem for us as a small team. Like I think. we have a 30, I mean, it's also expensive. It's very yeah. expensive. Yeah. So, I mean, there's, there's stores in Florida that's like, hey, we'd love for you, for you to send to fly down a teammate to come sample our store. And it's like, okay, well, that, that flight's going to be $1,000 and that's going to be a $3,000 trip and you've bought $200 worth of coconut oil. But how, then how do you make, but then how do you please them and make them happy? So those are things that we're constantly struggling with and constantly doing of, hey, how do we, Provide provide a sampling type environment to provide or do staff training where or hiring one of their staff members right. on the side to do a sampling right. training for us. I mean, those are constant questions that we're trying to figure yeah. out and solve and figure out the best way to do that to make sure we're making them happy, our customer happy, but then making sure that at the end of the day we're still making sure the bottom line is right so we can be a sustainable business. Have you figured out a good solution for that? Because I would think that's a staff training for one of their staff. Why? What do you see the downfalls of that? What doesn't work? Um, for that? Within, so within a natural health food store and a, or, a, or a grocery store or something like that, you've got a, a potentially higher turnover rate than normal. And so you could get a staff and you could spend some money and some time training them, but then they could be gone in a week. And so that's happened a couple of different times. Really? You've got someone lined up and then all of a sudden they've got a new job or they're fired or something happens and it's like, 
Okay, we're back to ground zero. So that that's the hiccup with that. I think that has been the most successful model so far. Uh, but then there's just there's always kind of give and take with all options. Yeah. So Matt, what are some big other big challenges or mistakes that you look back on that I don't know if you wish you had avoided it, but that you learned a ton from that you know you'll never repeat. Um, supply chain. We uh, in an attempt. So as when you're bootstrapping a business, you're always trying to save money. One of the areas we would continually try to save money and always get burned was our logistic shipping from Vietnam. I mean, we've shipped in containers uh, through Houston into Central America, through New York, through California, uh, through New Orleans. The worst mistake ever was it was the middle of winter, and this was in 2014. 2014 was a terrible winter. Uh, we yeah, shipped I'm in, in Chicago, horrible. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it was miserable. We shipped in a container into Canada and um, into, I think, Montreal, and they were going to train it across Canada and then deliver it to Toronto, and then they're going to truck it down to Indiana. Uh, but in the middle of winter, trains literally freeze on the tracks in Canada. And so Jeez. we had orders pending, and since we're small, I mean, our we're basically getting an inventory and moving it out basically the next day because we're just trying to make, maintain our cash flow as much as possible. And we had a train stuck in Canada for almost four weeks. Uh, it got to the point where my brother and I actually rented a Penske truck, drove 18 hours into the Canadian really? Tundra, Whoa. and tried to get the oil off the train ourselves, which we were told was illegal. <laughs> <laughs> so then we drove back to the station and basically just waited for it to arrive. But that was... That was an area where we kept trying to save money. Uh -huh. and it was just, it's an old business, and you just you find the trusted, reliable partners, and you just stick with them. So we'd always try to use these student technologies or shipping startups, and I mean, we've been burned. And it, I mean, when you when you don't have oil for three weeks, I mean, the the qualitative and goodwill cost of that is much more than just the actual cost. I mean, it's thousands and tens of thousands of dollars. So that's yeah. our that was always our biggest issue. You and, tried to pull up. Pull off like a Breaking Bad heist or something. <laughs> so we, with the, yeah, yeah, that was that was in Canada. It was it was an interesting time. So how much do you have to special package it since it is, t you know, it changes states with temperature? Or does that not matter? Um. So I mean, yeah, we, we've got a couple different filling machines, a couple different um, just unique selling points. Our body butter uh, is a solid. And so we're filling uh, most everything we do is a hot fill. Uh, it's, at, it's 90 degrees, and we're filling it, so it's pretty. It's like a liquid filling into the jar. But then the body butter is a thick paste, so that that takes a totally different um, type of machine and process and time, and it's much more hands-on and labor-intensive. Yeah. Um, and then we're bringing it in in either one thousand-gallon toast or fifty-five-gallon drums. So being able to break those down and handle those uh, yeah. uh, is unique, and it's. I mean, now it's kind of more systemized and set up and streamlined, but yeah, I mean, getting through there, there's multiple times yeah. where you're figuring out how we're going to roll this 55 gallon drum down this hill and catch it. So, <laughs> yeah, I want to hear about, I don't want to jump too out of, I want to hear about the first factory and setting that up, but I want to hear about the origins of the company first, but any other mistakes or challenges that would be important to, to talk about? Um, I mean, I think shipping, logistics, uh, the content creation wheel, um, and then customer service follow-up. Uh, we've, I think, over as a small business, as you're getting new business, we're always, in our mind, was like, hey, we're great with customer attention. We're great with customer attention. We're always calling our customers, our wholesale customers, our retail customers. But then you look back and like, oh, well, this person hasn't heard from us in four months. And so that was something where it's we're just constantly trying to get better where I mean, even though we're in a digital age and there's email marketing, and I think the majority of people still are receive well a phone call, and that's one thing we're always trying to implement within our staff and our team and everything like that is, I mean, let's try to touch every single one of our customers once a month to let them know that we care about them and that we're there for them and provide yeah. them with some sort of solution. And I mean, now that it's thousands, it's it's more of a an overload, but it's worth it. And I think if we can have a quality product with incredible customer service, I think we're going to continue to build a sustainable business. And that's something that we're always just trying to push, and that's something that we have not done great with in the past, just because it is a lot of work, but I think it's work well worth it. Yeah. So I want to go back, man. I know 
you said that the reason you started this is you saw the huge differentiation between how coconut oil is manufactured and how you knew it could be much better. But why were you even in, you were in Vietnam at the time, mm -hmm. right? So yeah. Why were you, what brought you there? Um, so in 2010, uh, my brother and I basically went backpacking in Southeast Asia. Uh, we had saved some money up. We had a, a previous business um, where we inputted textbooks from yeah. Thailand and sold them online. Yeah. And you inputted uh, what was it? The, we this... imported university textbooks. Oh, university uh, textbooks. Direct, oh, direct from Thailand. Then we sold it on Half.com and eBay. Oh. Uh, I was 16 years old at the time, actually, and we actually got sued by, ma by one of the major publications. Really? But then when they realized there was a couple of kids, they basically just said, close on your business and we'll leave it alone. Why did they sue you? Because uh, they said it was a uh, business? Yeah, it was, well, they, the whole claim was it was a pirate and copyright. And actually, the case was actually just settled last year between Costco and one of the major publishers because they went after everyone. And Costco, the court case went all the way to the Supreme Court. Costco actually won. So we would have stayed with it for seven years, and <laughs> we actually would have won. So that was a little, that felt a little better. But yeah, we closed on our business. Uh, we had some money saved up, so we went backpacking in Southeast Asia. Yeah. Um, so we had some experience in international business. We were over there and just started recognizing opportunities. Uh, Vietnam was a different place six years ago, much more closed off. And we, there were people actually on the streets would come up to us and be like, "Hey." Uh, like basically present us with business opportunities, and we're like, "What are you like? What are you talking about?" Like, no, 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 no. And that's where we met our why Vietnamese because business they partner. couldn't get to the U.S. or why were they? What were they doing? I mean, I think they. I mean, they see two, uh, two Western guys. Uh, I mean, walking down the street, and I mean, there are a couple of the guys like, "Hey, I, I've got this. Do you think I could sell this in America or do this and do that?" And we're like, "We have we have no idea. We don't we don't know how business works in Vietnam. I mean, Vietnam was." It's a communist country. It's much more capitalistic uh, it's now. And so uh, we're like, oh, there actually might be some opportunity here. We went back to the States. Uh, our Vietnamese business partner came to America to meet us. Um, this is Kim. This is Kim. Yeah. And she basically saw an elk walk across the road and said, well, what are, like, those are, that's an elk with big horns. Uh, deer horn is actually a Chinese medicinal supplement in Southeast Asia. It's kind of one of the older medicines. Yeah. And pound for pound, it's about the same price as gold. Really? And so she was like, who owns all these deer? And we're like, what do you mean who owns all these deer? She's like, well, what do you mean? And we're like, no, they're, they're wild deer or they're farm raised or this. And she goes, well, there's a lot of money over there. So that's how we actually got started in import-export. We actually started exporting deer antler. Really? Uh, sustainably, sustainably sourced, of course, into Vietnam and China. Wait, <laughs> how did you meet Kim in the first place? <laughs> We actually met Kim at a, there was a couple of different places in Vietnam where, where Westerners would go to speak Vietnamese, learn Vietnamese, and yeah. Vietnamese would come to speak English. Yeah. And it was actually just upon a happening meeting hmm. where we started talking, she was teaching us Vietnamese, we were trying to learn English, and we just connected. Um, she's got a great story. She's from the jungle, where actually now our factories are, brought herself. So what does that mean? Tell me what that means, from the jungle. <laughs> she didn't see electricity until she was 16 years old. Really? Like, like lived from in the, the jungle. jungle. Like from the jungle, she had a pet python, which what? she would ride around. Wow. Things like what you can picture like the jungle in a movie would look like is right. the, the jungle where she's from, working in the rice fields, growing up, all right. sorts of things like that. Um, so, I mean, uh, uh, an authentic jungle. <laughs> so what 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 did their do you ever see? What does their housing look like in the jungle? I mean, the fresh, sustainable water is a big problem. Uh, that's one of the things we do to get back is we actually help build housing um, and things mm. like that in the jungle regions. Um, and that's one thing we're always trying to give more of and give back. Um, but, I mean, it's you're sleeping on mats on the floor. You're living in these shanty yeah. houses. Uh, it's I mean, it's pretty grim. It's getting better as there's more developing. The UN's doing a lot to help the people in kind of rural Vietnam. But, I mean, there's still 40 million people that live in the jungle to Vietnam. Really? Wow. Um, it's a It's a... It's a yeah, it's a black and white kind of story. Tale of two cities where you've got a fast developing economy, but then you've still right. got a lot of people uh, yeah. who are quote unquote left behind, I guess. But I mean, maybe you wouldn't say that, but it's like a lot of countries around the world. So, yeah. I would like to see, I'm going to get off topic for just a split second. I'd love to see a GoPro on these coconut pickers. Yeah. And that, for like a day. Have you fantastic. done that before? No, that actually, I'm going to write that down. Um, you know, I think you, that you would just, be, that'd be unbelievable. To see like a day of what they actually do and how they they do it, five hundred coconuts or whatever it is. Anyways, 
Yeah, when, when that happens, you'll be the first one I send that video to. Yeah, send them to me. Um, so, okay, so you met Kim, and she came over to the U.S. That's mm-hmm. when she saw the elk. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And then how did you go from that to actually sourcing sustainable deer antlers? <laughs> like, I would have been like, yeah, that's cool, and be like, move down with my life. Yeah. So, um, I mean, I think, I mean, with my, I think we, my brother and I, uh, we are opportunity addicts, yeah. and so we saw an opportunity. We saw some potential. Uh, we went basically to an online resource of deer farmers in America, and we handed the list to my mom and said, "Hey, here's 600 farmers. Call every single one and see who who wants to give us antler." Basically, was how we went about it. Uh, Luke went to Vietnam with Kim. They started figuring out ways to import it. Um, they found a couple different pharmacies who were willing to buy it. Uh, and then that was just that was kind of the process. Yeah. And so, like most things, I think as an entrepreneur, you're kind of just learning your way into right. it. So deer uh, antler, what was next, Matt? Import deer antler. Uh, and then we started exporting. How much random, more random can we get? So keep going. <laughs> exactly. So we went from deer antler, and then we went to uh, cinnamon, cashews, and construction sand. So we actually started exporting a lot of things to India hmm. um, in 2012, 2013. Uh, and then right around that time, the Indian economy dropped out. Uh, I mean, I think the uh, the rupee, I mean, basically tanked overnight. And that was basically almost the end to our business. We almost went bankrupt. We had wow. a couple of different shipments on the sea. We lost our shirts on. Um, and then we started brokering coconut oil and other raw foods. We started representing quite a few suppliers. Yeah. So I what are the raw the foods? Because you could have gone any route with these raw foods. And I remember reading a post like, you know, you saw these lush fruits and vegetables and i could see you going a lot of different routes with this so what else were you considering um i mean everything from i mean tapioca to uh cashews are still a big one in vietnam to rice uh to even hardwoods and softwoods uh vietnam does a lot of furniture so Mm. all i mean we were as an opportunity that's another problem as an opportunity addict is everything's an opportunity right where it's now over time we've learned to hey we're we do coconut oil right. and we're only going to take on opportunities that involve our right. core focus right uh what was, was a close kind of, second though like you were almost considering but didn't make the cut <laughs> uh frozen yogurt mix frozen yogurt mix like the frozen. stuff you put you know yeah. that it comes out like mcdonald's or something like that Yep, that's that's exactly what it was. Huh. And that, that Why was that? more the frozen yogurt scene had just hit Vietnam. And so uh, that was a good thing to import. And then there were a couple people manufacturing quality stuff that we had some buyers in Europe for. Okay. Um, but then, and that was, it kind of tied back into, we had always had our, like a, well, phase two of our business is we're going to bring more something to market ourselves. Yeah. Because having your own brand and having your own business, it's much more profitable than brokering something yeah. where you're making you five to ten percent. Control it, yeah. And that's where I mean the coconut oil. I mean it was it was it was lucky. It was a blessing. It, it kind of fell into our lap within how we met the guy who developed the technology. Yeah. How did you meet him? Uh, in the jungles of Vietnam. You're I just mean, stumbling. I mean, what? <laughs> my my brother was over there uh, meeting a sand supplier, and. Yeah. I mean, I think it was a couple hundred yards away. Uh, our engineer, Tan, who was a refugee, grew up in Canada, spoke English, basically came out and was like, what are you doing here? He's like, Luke was like, oh, what are you doing here? You speak English, I speak English. And he goes, oh, well, I'm, I make coconut oil. I make coconut oil in a really unique way. And Luke's like, oh, well, we have an export business. Um, so they actually, that was basically their, their first conversation. Uh, we got samples. Luke brought them over. We started doing some tests and some different realizations. We figured it out. We worked on the technology with them, and basically how to make it productive and commercialable. Yeah. Um, what does it look like? Like, what is the? What is it like? I can't even picture it. Is it like a refrigerator or something? Or what is? What does the contraption look like? Uh, it kind of. It's a closed loop system that's probably. I think it's eight feet long, four feet wide, um, and it just basically it's just kind of a big box with tubes that connect all the way around. Uh huh. So it's yeah. it's a closed loop contraption. It kind of looks. It, it, I mean, it just <laughs> you're like if I showed you a picture, I'd have to kill you because it's, that's a technology. <laughs> but <laughs> no, I mean personally, I'll send you a picture so you can check it out. Yeah. But it, uh-huh. yeah, there's like two boxes, and it's connected by just circles that go all the way around where air flows through. Um, okay. And it's and it's kind of like an artillery unit where five people run the machine. They run it for eight to twelve hours. We make this amount of oil from it. 
Um, and then as we scale, we just add a new machine. But that was kind of the whole process. And so we met Ton. Uh, we decided, and the, the, the coconut was so expensive. I mean, our cost for oil is, I think, 100% more than the market price. And right. so we were like, well, the only way that we could deliver this coconut is by bringing it to a brand and ourselves. And you have to ship it over here. I mean, how do you even make money? It's like the oil is expensive. You're, you're flying it in and then training it from Canada. It's like the cost of shipping alone must be astronomical. It, initially, yeah, it, it definitely, definitely was. Uh, luckily, we had been doing international trade for a while, so we had good enough relationships. We understand it, understood the game well enough. Uh, but any single time you're air freighting um, a bulk oil, it just you're not going to make any money on it. So now, I mean, everything's both shipped and coming in every two weeks. Uh, but yeah, I mean, the initial rough goings were basically just trying to break even, trying to figure it out, knowing that if we could make it happen, there was possibility, and the product was good enough. And it was going to help enough people, and people were hopefully going to respond to it that it was going to be worth it. And so, luckily, um, it just has continued that way, and we've got a great team that's pushing it through. Yeah. So, so Matt, how soon after you met this guy with this technology did you actually have your first um, bottles for your brand? Um, so, I mean, we we basically I was in California at the time. Uh, my brother was in Vietnam. He called me. Um, I think in July, and said, "Hey, I think I think we've got something that we should brand ourselves and develop." I'm the branding, sales, and marketing guy. He's the production, international supply chain guy. Okay. And he's like, "Would you move back to Indiana to bring this to market?" You're in California, at the time. and I was in California, yeah. and I was like, "Well, California and Indiana sounds like a tough sell. It's a horrible uh, sell." Yeah. I don't know how do you sell you on that? <laughs> he goes, it, "It's it's a great opportunity." I, he's like, "I think I think this is." He's like, this is it's different enough, and it's going to help enough people that it's going to be great. And I'm holistically minded, food, health food, is my passion. And so I'm like, okay, yeah. let's try it. So I, I mean, I got back, and we kind of, I think we registered the company on July 13th. We started the branding, um, and then basically from August 1st, it was basically pedal to the metal, and then we launched our first jar on September 1st. So we were to market as quickly, super, super fast. So how many jars did you start with? Uh, nine. Nine, nine jars. jars. Yeah. So what do you do with nine jars? He ships them to you? Uh, he actually flew them over to save okay. money. So he, because he was coming back anyway, so just put him in his backpack. The yeah. Put him in his backpack. Uh, brought him over. We had nine jars. Walked around my mom's neighborhood. Sold a couple jars to them. We put them on our website. We put one on Amazon. Um, and then that first day, we actually sold our first jar. I think we had seven visitors to this site, and one really? of them bought the jar. Wow, that's pretty good. It was yeah. it was the strangest feeling in the world. You're like I'm calling people are like, Do you know who this woman is? Do you know who this person is? Nobody knew who she was. I called her to make sure she didn't make a mistake. Um, <laughs> was, what was the price then? Was it the uh, same price? The price then was uh, I think it was twenty five or thirty. Okay. And that was before we actually knew what our cost was. Um, so yeah, that was kind of the first story. Um, we sold the first jar the first day and we're like, Well, I, I think we just did a proof of concept. And then from there, we just kept bringing in a couple different cases at a time. So would you uh, then ship? So you went from nine jars to how many did you were you able to to order? I think we went from nine to uh, like thirty six, and then thirty six to ninety. How and soon? Then, did, how quickly did you sell out the ninety? Um, so within the first, so from September to uh, January twenty fourteen, we did sixty thousand. Um, so we actually we actually were pushing through quite a bit. Wow. Um, so I mean that's not I mean I guess that's not a lot, but we were doing a couple hundred jars a month that we were just trying to push through yeah. and pedal out and just figure out what we were doing. So yeah. And then you had eventually had that seven that order the um, the post on Yahoo that just blew up your site. It didn't blow up your had, site, but blew up your sales. Yeah, the, yeah. Then we had the Yahoo Shine article, which was the best and worst day of the business. So let's we, we we laugh about it all the time. But it's like, as as a, I think an entrepreneur, maybe everyone's had this moment of like, like, oh wow, this is this is what success must feel like. And then it's like, no, oh wait, to, to get seventy thousand dollars, you've got to fulfill seventy thousand dollars. What an it's an interesting how, concept. When yeah. You first so how it. do you? That, that's another point. Like, you're you're bootstrapping this, right? Mm -hmm. And it's not like a software as a service. It's not a digital product. You have to pay money for these physical goods and staff. How do you finance it? I mean, up until recently, it's been, I mean, friends and family. I mean, luckily, Luke and I had money saved up. We had quite a bit of credit just from 
our business and our credit cards. And so that was basically how we did it ourselves yeah. was, I mean, family friendly, bootstrapping, charging things to credit cards, personal credit cards. I mean, our, I think our, we almost killed our CPA the first time he looked at all the different avenues of ways we had spent money on the business. Uh, but that was just, I mean, you just, you just try to make it work and you, you try to work hard and uh, try to continue to pr provide value and you make it any way you, you can. And I think it's one of those things as well as when you're starting and you've got the, the naivety of the business and the fact that you don't know any better. Hey, why wouldn't I have charged on my personal card? Not a problem. And now you're looking back, you're like, oh, what a terrible idea. We should, definitely should have created budgets. But when you don't know, I mean, you don't know, especially for products. And yeah, that's for products. I mean, I think that's our our biggest issue is our cash flow. I mean, we're, we're still now on a four to five months cash flow cycle, which is a pain in the butt. I mean, what what do people do to get out of it? Just get financing? Yeah, financing your relationships with banks. I mean, with us, it's um, trying to shorten our production time, trying to shorten the shipping time, yeah. um, making sure that people who are paying uh, on demand upon their order, not giving them terms, trying to turn it around. It's just creating as many ways as possible to try to get more cash in the door. Because, um, yeah, I mean, four to five months when you're waiting on a couple hundred thousand dollars is a ton as a small business. Oh, for sure. Because the, the more successful you get, the more product you have to produce and you're just going to have to spend more money. Yeah, it's and that's that's another thing that we've realized too. Is yeah, I mean, growing and just growing and growing for inventory costs a ton of money. So, so two things I, I don't want to forget in, to mention is hiring is huge and setting up the factory is huge. When do you hire your first uh, employee? Uh, we hired our first, so we launched September first. We hired our first person. I think it was October nineteenth. Mm -hmm. uh, so a little almost almost two months after we started. Um, what do you hire for? <laughs> it was more just like a hodgepodge of I mean, customer service, packing orders. I mean, basically doing anything and everything that needs to be done. Everyone to that. I mean, everyone still to this point is wearing multiple hats and doing multiple things. But it's just running around, calling people, packing orders, and um, yeah. I mean, that was that was our first hire. It's just oh, kind of a hodgepodge. And I think you, our first. It looks like you're. Go ahead. I was gonna say our first. I think our first seven hires were just more of a hodgepodge of, "Hey, this is you're working for Skinny. You don't really have a title. Let's just make it work, and we'll figure out what to do every day." Because it does look, at least it appears on your team page, that people do have a specific role, and you have it delineated now. Yeah. So now, I mean, now we're in a place where um, I think the team page needs to be updated. Because I think we're at eighteen or uh, no, we'll be at twenty people. Uh, 20 full-time employees, we've got a marketing department, we've got a sales department, we've got yeah. a customer service department. So yeah, now everything's structured. And um, but it's, and then you run into the struggle of how do you create an organization that's functional, but then that's still innovative, where everyone gets along and everyone is growing towards the same focus, but then yeah. there's still the structured dynamic of those operational efficiencies. So that's yeah. now the struggle, too, of people. What order did you start to put those departments in place like you're like, okay we got to take this hodgepodge and like put this department first and uh sales and customer service i'm a i mean i'm a uh -huh. i'm a big believer in just revenue i mean if you can create revenue right then there's going to be a time i i'm a big believer there's going to come a point in time where you can either hire somebody or you can learn the skill to turn that revenue into profit as long as you've got a margin that's probably above 40 to 50 yeah. percent and so that's kind of where my first proponent is and so we've always pushed sales as much as possible, and that was kind of the first department we've carved out. So it was sales, and then customer service, um, then finance. Where now I look back, and finance probably should have been the first one, uh, <laughs> and then <laughs> and then operations, and then R and D, and then production, etc. So you say finance should have been the first one? Why? I mean, I think I mean finance is is the basically the backbone of the blood of any organization, and making sure that. When you're selling a product for twenty five dollars and you're realistically not making any money, that's not sustainable. And you need to have somebody that tells you that. And we've got a great uh, CFO. He actually was our CPA when we first started. Okay. He's on board now, and he's uh, yeah, he's just he loves the Cubs. Is he from Chicago? Yeah, he's from Chicago. Yeah, he's okay. from uh, uh, a suburb on the uh, north side, I think. Is he in Buff Indianapolis Buffalo now? Creek? Buffalo Grove. Buffalo Grove. Yeah, that's yeah. where he's from. Uh, yeah, he's in Indianapolis now. Yep. So everyone's yeah. local uh, on the local team is is local in Indianapolis. Yes, that's correct. Okay. Yeah. So very interesting. So what what do you think of the most the pivotal hire was for you? Because it's it's not easy to hire. 
the most pivotal hire was Mike, our CFO. Yeah. I mean, he was the one who came in. I mean, he spent, I mean, for the first two months, he was he basically slept at the office, just going through the books, really? figuring figuring oh. out the cost of goods, figuring it all out, and getting us in a financial position to know where we're going, where we're going. Because with me, it's, like I said, my mindset, and it's we argue about it all the time, is as long as we're generating revenue or we're growing revenue, then there's someone out there who's going to be able to come help us or give us finance. Here, or clean this like up, that. Mike. Just, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> like, I made some sales. You You clean it up. Yep. So that that that's my motto, and that's where the yeah, the most pivotal hire was Mike, and he came on uh, last September, and I mean since then's really clean up our our finances to a point where I mean yeah we are financeable, um, and we're able to basically grow sustainably, and we know what our growth ratio can be and should be. Yeah. So talk about the sales growth and putting the sales team together for people who are still just hustling, bootstrapping, and now you have more of that process so people can think okay, eventually I'll get to that following that that sales process which is probably more comforting at night <laughs> uh yeah so i mean our we have uh so we so skinny is unique in the fact that we sell in three distinct channels uh we sell to medical professionals you we do sell, okay yeah so we actually have a, a whole medicinal pro line that's not available on our website oh cool uh but that is we use some unique ingredients and some new, unique processes for these products for doctors to sell directly hmm. uh and then we have our skinny our skinny beauty line which is for uh, online and then gift boutique salon spa yeah. and then we've got our uh, grocery or we, we have our grocery line uh, which is for grocery stores such as I mean Osco Jewel actually I think is going to be picking up some of our That's products awesome. soon I know so we're right around your right around your block cool. uh, and so that those are the channels and so for each one of those channels we have a kind of a team leader who manages that channel manages the development and then under them we have uh, an inside kind of sales admin customer support and then we have an outbound salesperson who's making cold calls etc yeah so those are kind of how we're setting it up and then as those channels become more profitable we're just hiring more customer service reps to follow up behind them um and then we have kind of an overall inside sales manager who works with reps and distributors uh international distributors as well too yeah what works with cold calls matt that's not an easy no cold easy i mean it's getting people to, to make constant cold calls is my basically the, the biggest the biggest pain of my day because that's how sales are still made. I'm, I'm a big believer in that. Yeah. Um, and I mean, cold calling with a product is unique because it's not like, hey, it's a service. It's more of a, uh, hey, this is uh, this is Matt Getty from Skinny Coconut Oil, and they're like, well, I have coconut oil. And our response is, well, has anyone ever tried to sell you coconut oil? And they're like, well, no, because yeah, because all coconut is the same, but Skinny, here, we'd love to send you a sample, and I'll call you in two weeks. So those are kind of the processes that we've been trying to refining over the time of, let's just get the product in their hand. If we can get the product in their hands, they're going to recognize the difference, and then we can talk to them about their margins, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like that. So how did you discover the medical professional route? That that uh, struck me. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's uh, I mean, the blue ocean. So where, so coconut is a commodity. There's 300 brands of coconut oil. Where Where is coconut not going? Uh, my mother is actually a natural medical doctor, and so she's really? the one... Yeah. So oh, she, okay. Cool. So yeah. So she's got a she's got a natural medical background. Uh, she's an active practitioner when she's not helping out her sons. What of course. kind of patients does she see? Um, all types. I mean, she she practices majorly she, within natural supplements and yeah. uh, energy and medicine things like that. But she's got like a family practice. Like she she's a primary care, not like a specialty. She didn't, you know, specialize um, in anything. She specializes. No, I mean, she specializes in. Kind of like holistic healing, hmm. um, which is I mean that's rare for a medical doctor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and that's and that was because her. There are quite a few of them out there now. Yeah, um, who are getting into the alternative yeah. Eastern mess Western medicine mix, and coconut is a great added to them. And especially since we're alkaline, they understand why an alkaline coconut is beneficial to their cells and to their body. Sure. And so that was kind of our first retail route was selling to doctors. Oh. And so that was kind of our first channel. Then from the other ones, we branched out besides online. Online was our focal point and our main focus, of course. Uh, but yeah, but then dentists as well with the oil pulling. Uh, yeah. So if you've got dentists in the family, we'll send them some oil pulling samples yeah. and see what they think. I'll tell them for sure. There's a big convention in Chicago, or it actually just ended last week, and I was asking them, like, as they were on their way, is there anything natural? And he's like, I'll look out for you to see nice. if there is. So yeah. I'll report back to you to see what they said. That'd be fantastic. Yeah. Um, I wonder, yeah. So it's one of the biggest, you know, 
you know, American Dental Association, I think mm-hmm. it is, puts on the conference in Chicago. Um, so your mom was like, okay, this can go in medical offices. Mm-hmm. Hmm. And so that was, and that's a different animal in itself, selling to a practitioner because they're more, they're used to pharmaceutical reps and follow ups and that kind of aspect. And so we've tried to kind of create a sales channel similar to that, but bootstrapping it as well. Uh, but yeah, so we, yeah, so that was, that was a channel we sell to. And uh, with our patent, we're unique in that aspect. And so it, it's a good avenue for us to grow and to scale into. Yeah. So how is it working with family? Your, uh, your brother, you work with your brother and your mom are both in the company. Yep, you. It's a it's a love hate relationship. I mean, it, the family's great because they're partners that you know that's always gonna have your back. Yeah. I mean, blood is thicker than water, but at the same time, it's. I mean, if when you get when you get frustrated, like a normal partner or a normal, let's say, employee, you're not just gonna go yell at them. Where with family, it's you probably do yell. We're that them. yeah, we're that loud, rambunctious, heated conversation, heated argument, but it's good because I think it drives innovation. It makes us always trying to be better. And my brother and I are very competitive, so even though we're working towards the same goal, it's. Hey, is our sales and marketing going to be better, or is our production and our capacity and our logistics going to be better? And so I think that's another reason uh, for our growth is, I mean, pedal to the metal, and then let's just let's let's make this successful, let's make this sustainable, and let's help as many people as possible. Yeah. So, Matt, the first factory. Mm-hmm. Tell me about setting that up. That had to be a night, uh, pain. Yes, it um it was definitely a place that we would not have been super comfortable showing a ton of people. But it's not. It was. It was not a Western standardized factory. It's more just kind of like a hut with a machine in it with some coconuts. <laughs> uh, I mean, as as bootstrapped as possible. I mean, of course, it was clean and it was processed, and we were we followed all the FDA protocols and the export protocols. Uh, but it was still, yeah, it it was definitely a struggle. Uh, I mean, the electricity would go out six or seven times a day. Really? Yeah, it was. We just didn't. We didn't run the electricity right, and then it was in the jungle. And then, I wish you had pictures of this. Do you have pictures of this stuff? Uh, I do. You do. I'll send you. Uh, I'll send you some pictures. I'll put them on the, the outside post and things sure. like that. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, let me write that down. I'll send yeah. you some pictures of the factory. But yeah, that was. Uh, and it's just it's just hot. I mean, it's you're just always. I mean, I don't know if you've ever been to Southeast Asia, but when it's no, I haven't. when it's when it's hot and it's in the wet season and it's just always raining. It's 100 percent humidity and you're, the, and you're in the jungle. It's like. I'm going to go take a shower and then there's no need to dry off because I'm just going to continue just to sweat for the rest of my life. Uh, <laughs> How but that hot was, is it? I mean, it's probably 80 to 90 to 96, 80 to 95 degrees, hundred percent humidity. Yeah. Um, it's, it's pretty warm. So are you staying in a hut when you're there? Where are you, where are you actually sleeping? <laughs> uh, so now we actually have, we have a full-time office in Saigon. I mean, before, factory. before you had a full-time office, where, where were you staying? Like in yeah, a just, hammock like, in the jungle? What, what, what are those? And, and a cot. Uh, I mean, my brother was the one over there most, most of the time. And I mean, the, the places he was sleeping were not, were a little shady. And so it was either in a hut uh, with a fan or outside in a tent. Or, I mean, I think at one time our marketing guy went over there to take pictures and he just slept in a hammock in the jungle with a, with a mosquito nest. Wow. And that was, that was just, that's just what you did. Yeah. I mean, you just, and I think... Every small business and every guy, any owner who's built something that says, yeah, I mean, you do what you do to, to make it happen. And right. uh, Not everyone's sleeping in the jungle, though. So. <laughs> it's, it's, it's unique, but I mean, we did that to ourselves, so right. <laughs> we can't So complain. the next factory, you know, what was the next step up after the, the that one? Um, I mean, nicer, larger. Uh, it actually had a room that we actually had a couple different beds in just for people, for guests to stay. Uh, at that time, we didn't we didn't have an apartment in Saigon that people would stay at. Yeah. Uh, and then the factories are uh, a three hour motorbike ride down south. Um, and then the third factory, which I mean, I'll I'll send you photos of each so you can kind of see it. Yeah. The third factory, which is just constructed. I don't have a final picture of the new construction, uh, but the inside is. I mean, it's it's stainless steel. There's. It's what you picture like a brewery factory to be like, or something like that. It's a lot nicer. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. Um, what are some of the software tools you guys use to run the business? I know you said um, Shopify, Zendesk. What else? So Shopify, Zendesk. Um, a big proponent of us is called Fishbowl. It's an inventory uh, raw material manufacturing management system. Hmm. Uh, integrates with QuickBooks. Integrates with Shopify. Uh, and then for shipping, we use ShipStation. And so that's those are kind of the bread and butter. And then now we're we're moving into uh, Salesforce for our CRM. And so mm-hmm. as we get bigger, we're going to more of these these softwares that are more automated, 
and they all link together, which is really nice. Mm-hmm. And so it's and those and it's the systems like that, and it's the cloud that enables small businesses like us to scale a whole lot quicker uh, with a least amount of an investment, just because we're able to tap into these great uh, software solutions at a fraction of the cost and yeah. not having to build servers and IT people and things like that. Mm-hmm. Matt, this has been fantastic, by the way. Thank you. I, I'm, I'm wearing you out, I can tell. <laughs> like, no, not at all. Oh, you're on, okay, awesome. good. Okay, good. Talk about, I talk about coconut oil all okay, day. Okay, good. So this, is just, this is normal. I can't tell. I'm like looking. I'm like, am I making this guy tired or what? But um, so skinny, people can go to skinnyandcompany.com and check it out. Um, and so I, since it's, you know, the e-commerce master series, I always ask the lowest moment business-wise and then the proudest moment. I mean, the lowest moment was having 1100 orders that you could not fulfill because you're thinking, I mean, it was literally, the, the, it was the proudest moment of we just made $60,000 online to then realize in the next day, we're not going to be able to fulfill those and we'll, we don't know what the next month's going to look like because we don't know if we're going to get the oil. Right. So it was, it was like, it was night and day, huge up, way down, and then just basically bucking down and saying, hey, we're going to make this through this no matter what. Yeah. And let's start calling a thousand people to let them know what's going to happen. Yeah. So, so um, as an entrepreneur, you get a eleven hundred sales, and you know you can't fulfill, and you're a problem solver. What did you do? We just we started calling people. Just, I mean, I mean, yeah, I think there were four people, and we made we were able to make I think a thousand phone calls in a couple of days. Really? Wow! Just knocking them out, pounding them through, letting people know, hey, we're going to get your order to you. We're so sorry. What can we do, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, um, and then just getting a hold of Vietnam and saying, "Hey, we got to airship as quickly as possible. Let's get it over here, um, and let's let's try to fix this because, I mean, now, I mean, those are and I think that's that's those are the, those are the moments where the business grows is when you overstretch yourself, you problem solve to figure it out, and then you're already there. Right. So it's and that's where I think we've been able to grow so quickly is yeah, if you can problem solve and adapt, and you just Try to persevere through it. You're always, I mean, you're going to basically fail your way into success, but if you overstretch, it's kind of like a stretched out sweater. If your sweater is massive, then you've got a lot of room to grow into it, where within the business as well, is if you've got to do something that's going to make you grow way outside your comfort zone, yeah. you know what that feels like. So when you then actually sustainably grow into that mark, you'll be good to go. So, what about the proudest moment? Uh, and the proudest moment was probably this past January. I mean, with within a three day pants, like three day time period, getting to a point where it was the initial, it was the first feeling where I'm like, all right, this actually, within two and a half years, this is the point where this is actually going to work, I think. Because we, we run a lot of business, we were set up, we were profitable, we were sustainable. And as, as an entrepreneur, it's those moments that, I mean, there's a lot of things that go on that most new people don't know about. And it's like, oh, all this has led to this. And we've actually created something that people get excited about yeah. and like. And they really, really care about, and so that makes you feel good because yeah. you're giving them something that's making them feel better. And so that that's that was a that was a great weekend. This is where you did the two hundred thousand in like three days. Yeah. Right. So what did you do to get people's attention at the trade show? Because you didn't just show up and stand there. I mean, you are methodical on what you're doing. We. So we we showed up. We um, we had a great booth design. We were set up. Uh, we had some unique things. We brought a couple different screens. We kind of brought uh, some technology. We had a, we basically had the best looking booth in the area, and then we were just meticulous with just reaching out to many people as possible. I mean, walking up and down the hallways, getting people to try the samples, talking to them, talking to them, talking to them, and then there just started snowballing. Where there was then sixty people around the booth trying to get into place in order to talk about it, to figure really? out what was going on, and that was kind of just. Yeah, I mean, if you and this is what we've learned over time with bloggers, sales, affiliate marketing, everything is if you approach it at a sales point and get the flywheel going and just keep it running, it's going to catch up eventually. Where you may not you may not see the the benefit immediately, but eventually you're going to see the benefit. Where the weekend was nice because we saw the quick benefit of getting out there and pulling as many people in as possible to get them to know why we're different. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean that's the, probably the best thing we've ever learned is, and for people out there like, oh, well, this isn't working, but I keep getting told it's going to work. Just keep doing it because if people are telling you it's going to work, then most likely it's going to work. It just is going to take a lot more time. Right. And you have to sleep in the jungle or do something crazy. Um, so like samples worked. 
in just telling the story? Is that you think what pulled people into the booth? Mm -hmm. And yeah. yeah, samples, the product is real. The product people can actually tell is makes a difference. Uh, and then the story, yeah. I mean, I mean, hopefully you can tell. I mean, we're passionate about what we do. We're passionate about giving people something unique um, and then building something sustainable around it that can continue to make a difference and be a disruptor in the industry. Yeah. Matt, love it. Last question. Why skinny? What? How'd you come up with the name? Well, I mean, we were basically, we had a couple different names um, until actually my little brother's football coach came over. We we're sitting around outside and he goes, well, what does it do for you? And we're like, well, it makes you, it makes you fit. Like coconut oil helps you lose weight. It, it's good for this. It's good for that. Uh, he's like, well, just call it Be Fit Coconut Oil. And we're like, oh, all right. And then my brother looks and he goes, what about skinny? And we're like, huh, huh. all right, I guess that could work. And then we started drawing up the label. We checked the trademark. It was kind of just a clear path to gold. And we're like, well, this is a huge blessing. You we'll can't go it. wrong with that word. <laughs> well, and, it, and it's an oxymoron. I mean, skinny fat. I mean, skinny coconut oil, it gets people's attention of like, okay, well, this doesn't make any sense. I mean, the jar basically contradicts itself. Right. What's this about? And so with that, um, it's kind of why we chose Skinny. And Skinny and Company uh, is just, yeah, continued from there. Yeah. Any final words, Matt, for e-commerce people out there, what they should or shouldn't be doing or from your experience? Um, no, I mean, I think as far as online sales go, I mean, there's a ton of buzz. There's a ton of just, basically, there's a ton of trash out there. There's a lot of people saying a lot of things. If you can identify a unique selling point and you can target that to a very specific market, I mean, even a thousand people, a thousand people can create a sustainable business for somebody. Yeah. And then you follow up with an incredible customer service. I mean, I think you're going to have a win no matter what. Um, and don't be afraid to go after commodities because you can differentiate yourself in a commodity just by marketing it differently, saying things differently. The process. And then once again, yeah. the process. And just being there for your customer uh, is where it's at, I think. Yeah. Matt, this is awesome. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Hey, I really, I really, really appreciate it, Jeremy. This is great, man. Yeah.